Um, before we formally start, um, just a couple of notices. Uh, the one was actually going to ask you to turn your Wi-Fi off on your phone, but you won't have any, so it doesn't matter. Um, Bimbi's asked me to remind you of the 21 days of prayer beginning on Tuesday the 1st of June running through to Monday the 21st. Uh, the idea is that you commit uh, one hour on one of those 21 days to pray and we would ask you if able, you're able to sign up. You can sign up online or uh, you can ring the office if you haven't got that capability. Uh, just over half the days have people signed up. It can be more than one person on a day, but we invite you to do that, continuing for our time of prayer we had between Pe Pentecost and Ash Wednesday. Are there any birthdays of he people here this morning? No, and we haven't been notified of any, uh, so that's fine. Let's just pray and then we'll begin our service following uh, as best we can on the blue service sheets. Father, we thank you that whether we have modern technology or not, we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that we will meet with you this morning and that those who in, uh, later in the day are listening online or tomorrow are listening online, they too will meet with you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we begin our service formally. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. We have come together in the name of Jesus to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek forgiveness for our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Every single one of us here this morning has been less than perfect, less than holy in our lives in the last week. But Jesus calls us to repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore we shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. Amen. Now let's stand to sing, remember, uh, you can't sing out loud, but you can use our bodies to worship the Lord together. And apologies again that we won't have the words up on the screen. Mike.
Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing. All that to death, many times, I wondered at your gift of life.
by Georgina. Just uh, to draw to your attention on your sheet, there are some responses uh, following this reading uh, before we have the Gospel and my talk. Thank you, Georgina. So our first reading is from the Book of Romans, 
chapter 8, verses 9 to 17, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. But when the Spirit of Christ <coughs> empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the Spirit. And if you are not joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, you are not of Him. Now Christ lives his life in you, and even though your body may be dead because of the effects of sin, his life-giving spirit imparts life to you because you are fully accepted by God. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. And since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same Spirit that breathes life into you. So then, beloved ones, the flesh has no claims on us at all, and we have no further obligation to live in obedience to it. For when you live controlled by the flesh, you are about to die. But if the life of the Spirit puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste his abundant life. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. And you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved Father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us, as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. You have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, and Christ shall give you light. When Christ, our life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. I invite you to stand for the Gospel reading. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these things you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Verily I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born from above? 
How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, Sorry, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. For some time now, uh, I personally have been quietly challenged by the Lord about the witness of the church. My witness personally. But the witness of the church in general, not just here at St Paul's, or even the dear old Church of England but for the whole church in the UK. And although I have spoken here before about witnessing in the sense of uh, testimony, of sharing with people we know or meet, praying for people, perhaps even at the supermarket or over the garden fence, as important as those are, it's not what I have been personally challenged about in the last few weeks as I have read and reread the passages for this morning. No, what has really grabbed me was the witness of our whole lives. Who we are, and how we behave. The Old Testament reading for today, which we haven't had, uh, is the story of Isaiah's great vision of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6. It begins, In the year 
King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne and seraphs calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Thrice holy, perhaps the one reference I will make this morning in my talk to it being Trinity Sunday. But then, a few verses on, we read of Isaiah's reaction. Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. I guess the idea or the thought that God is holy is not strange to us. It's, it's part of, you could say, it's part of the Christian life, the, the church's life, that we, as we've sung this morning, over and over, wonderfully, holy, 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 God is holy. It, it runs off our tongues quite easily. And equally, all of us, if we're absolutely honest, know that God may be holy, but we ain't. And if anybody is sitting here thinking that they are holy like God, you better have a word with me afterwards. I will disillusion you. But seriously, this idea, this amazing vision that I... Isaiah had, and incidentally is uh, reflected again at the very end of the Bible in John's great revelation, where he was taken up to heaven and saw the, the multitudes of heaven crying one to another, holy, holy, holy. But then into my mind came a thought from Peter's letter uh, to the Christians in what was then Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. He wrote this, As obedient children, never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you didn't know better. Instead, Shape your lives to become like the Holy One who called you. For Scripture says, you are to be holy, as I am holy. Wow. You are to be holy, as I am holy. And that's the Lord speaking through Moses, well over a thousand, twelve, fifteen hundred years earlier, we read it in Leviticus. Really? We are to be holy as God is holy? But God said it, so we can't ignore it. But very briefly, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean when God is holy? Well, it means he's pure, absolutely, totally and utterly pure. He's set apart. He's different. He's righteous. And it encompasses everything that's revealed in his glory, his mercy, his grace, his compassion, yes, and his justice. He has nothing to do with evil, nothing to do with sin. You remember the cry 
of desolation of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when the sin of the whole world was laid on the shoulders of Jesus, his father couldn't even look at him. He couldn't look at him and Jesus felt that. Notice he called him my God, not my Father. But of course we know it didn't end there because after those three hours of darkness and it was dealt with once and for all, Jesus was able to say again, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. No wonder in that vision of Isaiah he felt ruined. But coming back to us being holy, okay, we, we might have some moments of feeling particularly pure or particularly compassionate but if you're anything like me, it's just moments. And as for being holy like God, surely not. But wait a minute. God never tells us to do anything without giving us the ability to do it or be it. So being holy is no exception. He has a way for us to be holy as he is holy. And that means to radically change us. Not some superficial thing like putting on a different pair of clothes or having our hair cut in a different style or moving to another house. No. God has a radical change to deal with our unholiness. For Isaiah, it was a burning coal touching his lips. For us, it's far more radical than that. It is as Jesus was telling Nicodemus to be born from above, to be born again by the Spirit of the Holy God. Is this not the heart of the Gospel which Paul outlines in Romans? When we accept Jesus in repentance and faith, we die with him on the cross. Don't ask me to explain it, but we do. We die with him on the cross. Our old self, our old ways. But as with Jesus, it didn't end there. We rise again with him to new life. A new life controlled by the Spirit, as we heard from Romans 8. A new life not governed by the old ways which the Bible in different translations variously calls the flesh or the sinful nature. It's from this radical change when we are converted that comes the call of God to be holy because I am holy. Well, you might sit here and think, so much for the theory, it's all very nice for a preacher to stand up here and prattle on about it. But how does it happen in practice? How do I, how do you become holy as God is holy? Well, this after all is where the rubber hits the road, if you like, 
and there are various issues and I want to address two ways in which people deal with it, two common ways. The first is can it be, achieve, can it be achieved, this holiness, by simply trying harder? And at the other end of the scale, if you like, are those who would say, well, does it really matter? Do I need to become holy? Because surely God tells us how much he loves us and he's full of grace and mercy. Let's look at those two. First of all, can we achieve it by trying harder? Ever since the fall, Humankind has been trying to get back in God's good books by one way or another, by simply being good or religious observance like coming to church or whatever. But any understanding of the gospel knows that that simply doesn't work. Only faith in Jesus' cross and resurrection can restore the relationship and build on it. But sadly, there are still many in the church up and down the land who haven't really got it. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody here. I'm not here to accuse but there are people who call themselves Christians. They've, they know they're saved. They know they've got their ticket to heaven when they die. But then they live as if it's all down to them. And thus the call of a preacher from time to time to call them to be holy just becomes another slog, another rod to which they can beat themselves up. And it becomes so depressingly futile that they simply give up. But just as becoming a Christian is a gift, so is the path to holiness. That's what the Romans passage is all about. By the Holy Spirit given to every single one of us who has been born again. By the Holy Spirit, the corrupt ways of our flesh are put to death. And we can live a new and holy life. But it's important to remember, and this is very important to remember, it's a process. Becoming holy is not a snap your fingers and you're suddenly perfect. If you think that, look in the mirror next tomorrow morning when you clean your teeth or shave or comb your hair. If you think when you look in the mirror that you're perfect, then you're deluded. <laughs> Those of you who are married, just ask your wife, us men. They will take great pleasure in pointing out that we're not perfect. It's a process. When we're born again of the Spirit, we're not instantly holy. Any more than when a baby is born, it's not instantly adult. There's a whole process of growing up. And that means, of course, there will be struggles. There will be slipbacks along the way when we are anything other than holy. But God knows about that. And that's why there's wonderful promises like 1 John 1 9 that some of us may well no, by memory. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But sometimes we stop there. 
But the verse goes on, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means he's in the process, the process of making us holy. Well, if we can't achieve it in our own strength, does it really matter? That's the other question. And there are sadly too many Christians who think, yes, I've given my life to Jesus, but now I've got it back. And I'm going to live my life as I want to live it. I can say confession on Sunday in church, that'll be fine, that's all right. Because God is so loving and gracious, it doesn't really matter how I live. This is not a new idea in our generation, as common as sadly it is. Paul addressed it in Romans 6. What then are we to say? Should we continue to sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. Heaven forbid, he says, how can we who died to sin go on living in it? I ask this question because I am convinced very sadly, that there are many Christians who consider themselves Christians, but are not living or even seeking to live a holy life. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. Remember when a preacher points the finger, there are three pointing back at him or her. I'm not That is not my place to judge, but it is without doubt one cause of the church's weakness. We have a friend who recently retired from being an associate vicar in a very big church, nowhere near here, I'm not going to give any hints as where it might be, but a few years ago, the married vicar decided there was another lady in the church more attractive. Need I say more? He's no longer at the church, he's been moved on. But the ramifications of that unholy, somebody's got Wi-Fi, Um, the ramifications of that unholiness still rumbles on in that church. When we compromise with the world's standards, we are deeply weakened. But sin in the church is nothing new. Read 1 Corinthians if you're not sure about that. Holiness matters in the end because it demonstrates God's love and purposes and purposes for all humankind. Words, even signs and wonders, people being healed, etc., is not enough unless our lives are changed. Our lives changed. But I believe there's another reason to heed the call to be holy. And in a sense, it's even deeper and more fundamental than our concern for our witness as a church. It is deep deep down our response to God's love. In the Last Supper discourse in John uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, Jesus repeatedly links love 
with obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's not a threat. It's actually a promise. Those who love me will keep my word. You see, obedience to Jesus is not slavish and it's expression of our love and trust. Paul contrasts it, so wonderfully put in the passion version that we heard Georgina read. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back to the fear of never being good enough, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God. We want to be holy. We want to be obedient to the Lord and his expression of his love. No more do we have to obey him in the hope of being loved. But we obey him knowing that we are loved. I began my talk this morning by linking holiness to the church's witness that we must seek to be who we claim to be. To proclaim Jesus but not be becoming more and more like him is counterproductive at the very least. But just three words of warning before I finish. We must avoid in this seeking after holiness a holier-than-thou attitude that we are better than them out there. We know better than them out there. And together with that, there must be no judging if you've got a moment, read 1 Corinthians 5 where Paul is addressing the most horrendous sin in the church. Goings on that he says even the pagans don't do. And yet he says it's not for us to judge the people out there who are living like that. Yes, we must challenge. We must challenge our government about laws which are unholy. But that's not the same as pointing the finger at individuals and people. And thirdly, one aspect of holiness is to be set apart. But as Paul explains again in 1 Corinthians 5, we are not to be set apart in the sense of leaving the world. Not to be a little holy enclave, because then where is our witness? You. Me. We are to be holy, says the Lord, because... He is holy. We cannot claim to be saved if we go on living as before. Whatever the pressures of the world, the flesh and the devil. Grace has been, has embedded into us holiness in our lives. Yes, we have to make right choices, we have that still. And we have to yield to Christ and God's word as the Holy Spirit lives in us. Holiness is not merely actions we perform, but what we absorb and manifest as we live our lives in God's presence. 
For in reality, Christ is our holiness. Then our witness will be all the more credible and powerful in every way. Amen. Let's just be quiet for a moment or two and offer ourselves again, asking that Holy Spirit will come and continue the process of making us holy. There's a favourite prayer of mine at the end of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I invite you to stand as we declare our faith in God. Together, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue to worship God in song. Praise God from the Praise 
grateful to the Lord for uh, people who give of their money, their time, uh, whatever, to support his work here at St Paul's. So let's say together the words of thanksgiving. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Amen. We say the collect, or rather probably not, because you won't have it all with you, the collect for this Trinity Sunday. Holy God, faithful and unchanging, Enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your truth and draw us more deeply into the mystery of your love that we may truly worship you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to continue to sit and pray, led by Sarah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the church as it resumes its services and activities. We pray for your spirit to guide and to give vision for the way forward. Help us to embrace new ideas and ways of reaching out to others as we continue to pray for thy kingdom to come. Help us to hear your voice as we make decisions here at St Paul's for our seniors, our families, for the youth and children. We pray for all the church leaders in Orpington that they may be led by your spirit as they seek to fulfil your mission for the church. We especially pray for the process of selecting and appointing a new bishop for Rochester. Give wisdom to those seeking your will and direction for this diocese. May your church be a beacon of hope and a place of healing that points people to Jesus. May we be a holy people, reflecting your love wherever we work or live. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Lord, we pray for your world, especially for those places of conflict at this time. We pray for a lasting peace in Israel. We pray for India as they struggle with their COVID crisis and need for medical equipment and vaccines. We pray for peacemakers to be raised up and for tensions to ease. Give wisdom to all in authority, to governments and leaders throughout the world. We pray for decisions to be made in accordance with your will, that justice and compassion will be upheld. Bring healing, Lord, to your hurting world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in our own country impacted by the COVID pandemic, whether due to job losses, ruined businesses, health issues, or relationship breakdowns. Lord, so many people of all ages are suffering long-term effects now. We pray for those who continue to feel fearful or isolated 
and are feeling they have no hope. You are the God of hope. Shed your light into the homes and lives of all those suffering at this time. Bring healing to bodies, mind and spirit. We pray for those awaiting treatment or test results that have been delayed. We pray for those in hospital or in care homes and missing visitors. May they feel your presence and peace today. And now we name out loud or in the silence any known to us in need of your touch this morning. Jill. Catherine, thank you, Jesus, Jenny, thank you, Father, Phil, Tony and Becky, Philip, thank you, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our yeah. prayer. We give thanks for all your goodness to us for answered prayers, for healing of bodies and restoration of relationships. We are sorry for the times we forget to come back to you and thank you for the many blessings that we have received. We thank you for this family of God here at St Paul's. We thank you for the vaccination programme and the lowering numbers of COVID deaths. We give thanks for the easing of lockdown restrictions. Help us never to take our new freedoms for granted and to use each opportunity for your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who grieve and are missing loved ones. Surround them with your love and bring comfort to all those who have recently been bereaved or are close to an anniversary which has perhaps renewed their grief. We entrust our loved ones to you. We thank you for the gift of eternal life to all who believe in you and the assurance that they will be at peace with you where there will be no more tears or suffering. We thank you, Lord. Merciful Father, accept, accept these, these prayers. prayers. For the, For the sake, sake of, of your, your Son, Son our, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and now we join together in the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can I invite you to stand for the peace? I know we can't... Um, as it were, hug people yet, uh, although Dean and I had a couple of days away this week and met some old friends that we know and trust. We had a hug. It was wonderful. Um, but, you know, when we do this in church, uh, I've actually, since I retired and, and in the earlier days, I used to do a lot of cover in churches I remember going to a church once to do their communion and um, I was told in no uncertain terms, we do not do the peace here. And I thought, how sad. Because in reality, it is a, a measure, really. It's not just an empty action or words, but it's actually us saying that the peace that we have from God, we share with you. We don't want anything to be between us, as that is what God's peace with us is through Jesus. Am I echoing a bit? Yes. Sorry about that. Christ is our peace. 
He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And I know we can only turn to one another, but let's do it. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And we remain standing for our final song. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our holiness. It's not something we've got to work up. It's something we've got to receive. We've got to believe that we are holy because you are holy. 
Lord, help us in our, in our fights with the world, the flesh and the devil. Help us in our times of temptation. Maybe we alert to your spirit this week as we go out into the world, may we be alert to what you are prompting. Thank you, Lord, for those divine appointments that we're going to have in this coming week with people. Opportunities to share Jesus. That phrase from one of my favourite songs of the time, in the chorus line, even in just a smile, may they know the Father's love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There will be prayer ministry over here, uh, at the side here in the memorial chapel. Uh, if you have prayer for anything, there will be people to pray with you. And remember, when we pray, we pray in total confidence. So if you share something that's very personal with you, perhaps a struggle you're having at the moment over some issue, then know that those you pray with, it won't go any further than you, them, and the Lord. So there will be prayer over there at the end of the service. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you, Mike, and the group for leading us in worship, and for the guys up the back wrestling as they have with all the technology. Amen. Thank you very much.